It's an exceptionally fascinating idea that's been raging in our mind's eye since the dawn of civilization, and we've all thought about it in one form or another. Going through the stars and visit distant alien worlds. Unfortunately for us, interstellar space is extremely vast, so our current technology is useless for reaching the stars. And to make matters worse, it takes 4.2 years for the fastest thing in the universe, light, to reach our eye from Alpha Centauri system. And that's the nearest neighbour to our sun. According to Einstein's theory of special relativity, nothing can ever exceed the speed of light. But what if there was a way to get around this cosmic speed limit? What if you could warp the fabric of space-time itself so you effectively traverse interstellar space? As far as we know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, period. It's not like we haven't wanted to make that happen. It's not like we haven't looked around the universe to see if we can find something that violates that rule. We have. We've looked hard. We've never found anything to violate that rule. Not only that, it is a fundamental tenet to Einstein's theories of relativity. So what that says is, this speed of light rule is not a limitation of technology. It's a basic fundamental feature of the universe. Now, there are other ways to go faster than light. You can cheat, cheat in a legal way. For example, on Star Trek, what did they have? They had warp drives. Warp drives, what did that do? Well, here's your galaxy and they're on one side of the galaxy and they want to get to the other. So what do you do? They turn on the warp drive and that takes the space-time continuum and bends it. And now here's where they are and here's where they want to go. They just take a little gap through the fabric of space-time, unwarp the galaxy, and there they are. They cross the 100,000 light-year diameter galaxy. Works every time. So that's legitimate in the sense that we know space and time can curve. And if you can control that curvature, you can get to a place much faster than a light beam would have taken. Much less time than it would have taken a light beam to traverse that same journey. I want warp drives that can do that. That would be really cool. But not only that, this little path that they took to cut from one part of their space-time to another, we have a term for that as well. It's called a wormhole. That is a portal in the space-time continuum that takes you from one part of the universe to another. And the more energy you have, the more you can curve major sections of the universe to traverse great distances. And I assert that if we're ever going to travel the stars, if we're ever going to cross the galaxy or visit another galaxy, it's going to have to be in some kind of way that exploits wormholes and the curving of the fabric of space and time. It's going to have to, because our fastest spaceships, if you hop a ride on them today, would take you 50,000 years to reach the nearest star to the sun. And the nearest star to the sun is sitting on our nose compared with the scale of the galaxy. In April 1970, the crew of NASA's Apollo 13 mission swung around the far side of the moon, putting them over 400,000 kilometers away from Earth. It's the farthest our species has ever been from our home planet. If we ever wanted to put humans on Mars, we'd have to top that distance 136 times over as the minimum distance from Mars to Earth is about 54.6 million kilometers, which is about a third of the distance from Earth to the Sun, 150 million kilometers, and we call this distance 1 AU for one astronomical unit. The farthest planet from our solar system, Neptune, is about 4.5 billion kilometers or 30 AUs away from the Sun. From this distance, it takes sunlight four hours to travel from the Sun to Neptune, these distances might seem astonishing to us, but they pale in comparison even with our closest star system, Alpha Centauri, with a whopping 269,000 AUs away. When we talk about distances to the stars, it becomes absurd to use astronomical units, so commonly the light year is used, which obviously, as the name implies, one light year is the distance light travels in one year. In 2025, the Parker Solar Probe will reach its top speed of about 690,000 kilometers an hour, making it the fastest object ever built. But even at that speed, it would take more than 6,600 years to reach the Alpha Centauri system. And that's an uncrewed spacecraft. We can only imagine the dazzling time it would take to send humans there. 
But that didn't stop scientists to think of a concept and a spaceship to do so. They are called Generation Starships. We can travel to the moon, it's like three days. Mars is nine months, some other planets a year, two years, five years. And we could probably get to the outer solar system in 10 years. That's within a human life expectancy. But here's my point. Until we discover wormholes or warp drives or something that could greatly shorten the time it takes to travel the vast distances of interstellar space, journeys across the galaxy will be hopeless unless we take on a different understanding of space travel and say, here's what we're gonna do. Let's put astronauts on board that know they will not be alive when they arrive at their destination. But those astronauts will have to be fertile so that they then mate, have babies, raise the babies, they die, now the babies are helped, the next generation is at the helm of the ship. And then they have babies and this continues. So there's a word for this. We've already thought this through. They're called generational ships. You'd have to control it because you don't want to make too many people. You need the right number of people. Plus you have to train them, right? You have to educate them because you need your engineers and your medical doctors and your space cadets, whatever. So this is the, it's called a generational ship. It has interesting ethical questions. To bring an entire generation of humans into the world whose only mission is to bring another generation into the world with a goal that they will never see. So anyhow, so just something to think about on generational ships. I mean, there's a lot more than what we just discussed, but it's an interesting dilemma that we have in the absence of warp drives. But let's say we decided to go through with this crazy idea, build a generation starship and develop a space program to send people to the Alpha Centauri system. Even if nothing goes wrong, and finally, after thousands of years, the ship arrives, there is absolutely no guarantee the planets will be suitable for life. Even though Proxima b, the exoplanet orbiting the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri, is within the habitable zone, there is no assurance it will be suitable for our space settlers. Imagine the cosmic facepalm of the last generation of the starship to arrive in its destination and find nothing of particular interest in the system. That's why a more plausible approach is required for interstellar travel. Another mission suggests of the use of solar sails, propelled by high-energy lasers to increase propulsion. At best, traveling at 10% of the speed of light, such a spacecraft would reach Alpha Centauri in about 44 years. So the last beacon of hope to travel across the galaxy lies on the use of some kind of warp drive. But even if they are theoretically possible, the development of warp drives is most certainly in the distant future. As for the present, we've only begun to scratch the surface of space exploration. When people say they want to go into space, and generally they mean they want to go into orbit. The astronauts that left Earth to go to the moon. So there was Apollo 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So eight missions left Earth to go to the moon. Not all of them landed, right? As famously, Apollo 13 did, and Apollo 10 was just a dry run for Apollo 11. But those are the only people who have ever left Earth for a destination. Every other astronaut, hundreds of them, are called astronauts, and we still say they went into space. And what that means is they went into low Earth orbit. So low Earth orbit is in practice where the space station is, it's about a couple of hundred miles up. So when people say to me, you wanna go into space and, and because somebody's got some orbital Taurus thing, and I'm thinking, to me, space is the large scale structure of the universe, not boldly going where hundreds have gone before, driving around the block, as low Earth orbit indicates. There's a functional definition of space. If you wanna ask, have you been to space, whether or not have you been in orbit? And that distance is the height above Earth's surface, where you've left enough of Earth's atmosphere behind you that the atmosphere is no longer scattering sunlight. I don't want the definition of space to be contingent on how thick your atmosphere is. Warp drives and wormholes are the two theories of faster-than-light travel that have long been a subject of fascination in science fiction. As for science fact, where theoretically possible, the complexities involving a wormhole or warp drive for interstellar travel have yet to be figured out. 
While warp drives and wormholes provide exciting opportunities for interstellar travel, the physics behind them are complex and the energy requirements are far beyond our current capabilities. Still, scientists are working on understanding these theories and are hopeful that one day they may be able to use them to explore the galaxy and beyond. Mm -hmm.